thank you, uh, Julian, um, for facilitating um, this meeting. And, um, and, and uh, thank you uh, to everyone uh, for joining us tonight uh, for this uh, virtual meeting. Uh, we tried this um, uh, last week um, with the uh, Vancouver Ancient Coin uh, Club, and uh, it worked out really nice. And uh, I'm, I'm happy um, to be able to do it again uh, for the uh, North Shore Numismatists. And um, this is um, um, a presentation uh, um, that I prepared um, some years ago uh, for um, two um, continuing education courses at um, UBC and then later at SFU. Uh, it comprises um, seven um, lectures, uh, starting with um, this one, Pre-Coinage Economies and the Invention of Coinage, and then um, Counterfeiting and uh, the Development of Coinage, and then uh, the um, Periods of Ancient Numismatics as um, um, scholars uh, study them, um, uh, archaic period, um, classical period, um, Hellenistic period, Roman period, and later Roman period. So um, I promise to do all of those um, uh, talks uh, for the um, Vancouver Ancient Coin Club, and, um, and you're all more than welcome to join us uh, when we do that. Um, the first time uh, we did this um, um, at the um, McGill Library, uh, and then of course um, the, the wires struck. And and I think uh, if there is one good thing about the wires is that you know we are able to uh, meet online and we can record this and um, and we can um, uh, put this on YouTube so that you know other people can also. Um, enjoy it. Um, my first presentation to the um, uh, North Shore Numismatists was um, in 2006, I believe, um, that took place um, at a church in North Vancouver. That's where the, the club used to meet um, some years ago. And, um, and I wanted to do um, this presentation actually there and uh, unfortunately um, we couldn't find um, a projector then and then um, I prepared um, uh, some um, uh, photographs um, uh, put on cardboard and I um, uh, presented my talk by showing those photographs that was that was fun. Uh, I enjoyed that, and um, I think last year I also um, did a, a, a talk at the club. So, um, so this is my third um, encounter with you guys, and I'm happy to be here. So, pre-coinage economies and the invention of coinage deals with uh, the um, um, the economics of um, uh, seventh, eighth um, century. Uh, BC um, and how uh, the humans uh, came to um, figure out to um, invent um, a means of exchange that dominates the world um, since um, it has started. And then I ask this question, what is the most important invention of the history of civilization? Of course, many people will um, have um, very legitimate suggestions. Um, and I add to those suggestions, coinage as a means of exchange to facilitate commerce and mass uh, production. This is just food for thought. I'm not really um, claiming that it is the most important invention of the human civilization, but it is a significant one. Uh, the word nomisma um, comes from uh, Greek nomos, which means law, um, currency, division, um, and then numismatics, art and science of studying ancient coinage. 
Uh, the earliest documentation of ancient coins begins in um, Renaissance, uh, like many other things. Uh, Wolfgang Lazius of Vienna published a single folio volume in 1558 as um, a specimen of estimated at about 700,000 coins. I have a smiling face there. Um, that was his projection, that was he thought that he could uh, bring together. Uh, but now we know that uh, there are millions and tens of millions of um, coins to catalog and to, to learn from. Um, 1898, 1927, a journal in International Archaeology, Numismati in Athens, um, started. Uh, it was one of the um, uh, most prominent um, um, studies at that time, and in uh, during the 1870s, the um, uh, invention of photography contributed to coin publications. Until that time, uh, people used line drawings, and they did a great job. If you ever come across those um, line drawings, you will be amazed, and, and, and you will um, um, appreciate the art um, and uh, the early mismatists put into uh, their work. Uh, photography helped Swiss scholar Imhof Blumer establish dye studies. So Imhof Blumer uh, was one of the earliest um, scholars um, who um, uh, went into detail um, studying uh, different dyes. Um, in uh, 1873, uh, the British Museum started um, publishing um, its own collection, um, a catalog of um, 29 volumes. Um, they are still valuable and, um, and, and, and great references. And in 1931, Silogin Numerum Grocum um, started in Britain. And um, it is um, uh, the um, it's it's the most important um, collection publication uh, format uh, adapted by um, almost um, all uh, numismatists um, um, compiling catalogs in every country. So you have SNG, the um, acronym. Uh, you have SNGs everywhere, SNG um, uh, Deutschland, Germany, SNG um, um, Netherlands, uh, Copenhagen, SNG Turkey, where I come from. So uh, SNGs are everywhere now. What's a coin? I'm sure you all know this, but I'm just going to uh, quickly go over this. Um, a coin is a means of exchange, usually round shape bearing the official sign or badge of a state, individual or institute that guarantee the weight and pureness of its metal. Coins that do not deteriorate much, even though they were buried under the ground for hundreds of years, play an important role in research and understanding of the ancient world. Therefore, they are considered the miniature libraries of history. What is money in, um, uh, in ancient world, actually, everything was money. Uh, people got by uh, using a barter system uh, in which almost everything exchangeable was money. Uh, food being the basic need was the biggest commodity. Uh, precious metals, especially gold um, and silver, uh, were well known long before um, the invention of coinage. However, commodities in barter um, were not always easy to carry along, and a commodity at hand would not always match another which was needed. So they needed something to facilitate um, the exchange. Now let's look at um, the ancient world and see what it was like uh, before uh, the invention of coinage. Um, now, um, we don't have, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, surviving um, storefronts. Uh, the Roman uh, cities excavated everywhere 
um, showed that uh, there were stores everywhere. However, uh, except for um, Pompeii, uh, we were unable to come across a, a storefront um, where everything was intact so that we could know, um, you know, what kind of material they had in the store. And most of those um, items that they might have in their stores were organic and they simply disappeared um, in the course of time. However, um, these two um, shipwrecks um, excavated off the coast of um, southern um, Anatolia uh, gives us um, uh, a glimpse of what it was like uh, to have a shop this, in this case, it's a, a shop uh, in the form of a vessel, a ship. The um, Ulubran wreck uh, from the Bronze Age carried 10 tons of copper from Cyprus, uh, 318 four handled copper ingots, each nearly 23 kilograms, uh, 31 two handled ingots, and a ton of pure tin ingots. Guess what they were projecting to do. And then they had 150 glass ingots. They are uh, shapeless, just round shape. They're not a word. Um, obviously, um, this was um, not, not coarse material. It is work material, but ready um, uh, to be reworked. And um, some other um, commodities from the Ulubran rack um, worked and cast gold lumps in many different forms, um, silver ingots, many different forms, uh, glass beads, millions of them, literally millions of them, um, um, a goblet, a gold goblet, um, a seal, um, a gold medallion. Uh, Woodbox writing tablet, elephant tusk, uh, hippopotamus incisors and canines, ostrich egg, um, agate and faience beads, oil lamps, um, statues, um, swords and daggers. So uh, back to um, the items here. Um, the, the goblet might be an, the order of someone, a king uh, or an important person. I cannot really imagine that um, one of the crew members um, would want to enjoy his wine um, in a, in a um, gold goblet. And, and then this gold medallion um, from the Canaan um, is really interesting. What was it doing in the, um, in the cargo of the ship? Um, was it purchased um, to resale um, in, in a different location? Who knows? Uh, the elephant tusk, I can understand. Ivory was um, a, an important um, carving and art material. Uh, if there was another use for it, I don't know. Um, ostrich egg, who knows what they were using them uh, for? Beets, of course, for ornamentation. Oil lamps, maybe they um, simply used the oil lamps um, in the vessel uh, during um, uh, the, the voyage. Um, or we don't know how many of them uh, existed in the cargo. Maybe they had hundreds of them, thousands of them. Um, they usually don't survive um, in the sea, um, you know, uh, after, after a long time. Uh, this bronze female figurine, um, head and hands and feet clad in gold uh, is certainly um, a, a special item. Um, it, it depicts uh, the worship of a certain uh, mother goddess. Um, so, and, and of course, the most um, important item here for me is the, the seal of Nefertiti, uh, the beauty that has come uh, is inscribed. Um, on uh, the the seal, it's it's also um, gold um, scar uh, from the Akhenaten um, time. Uh, so this this is these are some of the items excavated um, in in that 
um, shipwreck. In mention of coin money, according to uh, Herodotus, um, was the work of the Lydians. Uh, however, uh, Herodotus only says that uh, the Lydians uh, used gold and silver coins for the first time. Uh, he doesn't really say that uh, the Lydians invented the coins. All the same, all indications, all excavations, and um, other um, um, evidence that we gather from the ancient world um, indicate that Lydia was the beginning of um, ancient coinage. Um, the metal of the first coins was electrum, a natural ally of gold and silver found in the silt of the river Pactolus. Now, why do we talk about this river Pactolus? It is because, um, because of a mythological a very well-known mythological story. Um, I'm sure um, you will, um, uh, you're familiar with the myth of um, King Midas, um, Midas, as we say in, in, in Turkey. Uh, this is from the um, Ovidius uh, Metamorphoses. Uh, if you haven't read that book, I really recommend it. It's really funny and um, enlightening. So this uh, Phrygian king uh, Midas was a greedy man, and um, he um, he wanted to be very rich uh, all the time. One day, uh, his men uh, found this old drunkard, uh, and they bring uh, this drunkard to uh, the uh, the palace, and and uh, Midas immediately recognizes him to be. Um, um, Silenus, um, one of the um, companions of Dionysus. And uh, so he wines and dines knowing that he is um, a good friend of um, God Dionysus. And then uh, when he's sober, he takes him to um, the God Dionysus. Uh, the um, Dionysus was so happy, he says, um, uh, make a wish and I will grant. Um, the king Midas wished that everything he touched would turn to gold. And, um, uh, but Midas's wish turned against him because um, uh, he um, soon discovered that he was going to starve. He wouldn't be able to uh, eat and drink whatever he touched turned to gold. And then he went back to Dionysus and begged him to remove the spell. And finally, um, Dionysus said, um, go to the um, um, Pactolus River and, um, and, and wash, and the golden touch will uh, wash away in the river. And that's how um, uh, mythology tells us that um, the uh, gold, um, or in particular, electrum, is found in the silt of uh, pearls. All the same, if you um, go and check the, uh, uh, the remains of the King Midas at the uh, Anatolian Civilizations Museum in Ankara, Turkey, um, all you see is um, bronze. Uh, they found no gold in his uh, tomb, um, and most of them uh, are um, bronze vessels. The Lydians, um, it's, it's well worth um, studying. It's a very, very um, interesting um, uh, people in uh, Western Anatolia. Um, they started out around um, the um, central um, Western part of um, Anatolia. Uh, they are known um, since the time of the Hittites. Um, apparently, um, until they um, were um, extinguished by uh, the, um, uh, the Persians, uh, there were three dynasties. Um, in and around 680s, Gigas uh, became the king of um, Libya, and um, the previous um, 
um, capital was Haidis. It was um, somewhere northeast of Sardis, and he moved the capital to Sardis. And um, and he was the first king of the Mernade, um uh, dynasty. Uh, he took it over from the um, Heraclidae um, dynasty. The story, um, of course, this is um, uh, a myth and uh, not um, history. History only begins with um, uh, Croesus, of course. Um, uh, the Candalus, uh, the uh, head of the uh, Heraclidae uh, dynasty, um, had a very beautiful wife. Apparently, she was very charming, and he was so fond of um, her, and um, and he loved to brag about the beauty of his wife. And Gigas was his friend. And um, one day he uh, was talking about his wife again, and says, "You need to see her um, in, in in private. Um, otherwise, you will not believe me. No matter what Gigas um, says, he cannot uh, convince him not to do that." But the, uh, the woman um, takes it um, really um, offensive. And uh, when at night, um, and Candalus uh, secretly lets Gigas um, go into their chamber, the woman notices that. And then um, and, and, uh, the woman comes to um, Gigas and says, uh, you have to kill this uh, man and become uh, my king. And that is what Gigas does according to the story. And that's how Gigas becomes the um, king of um, uh, Libya. And uh, the dynasty that he started um, um, last until um, uh, the time of Croesus. So um, uh, these are the uh, four um, kings known uh, for Libya. Igas, Artis, Sadiates, and Aliates, and then finally the last king, Croesus, um, uh, and, and then uh, the Libyan um, uh, civilization dies. Um, the, most of the uh, uh, coins, uh, earliest coins, are attributed to the time of Aliates. Um, 610, 561 BC. Um, the last king, Croesus, um, um, was a very ambitious king. Um, the the uh, map here shows um, his achievements at that time. Uh, the war between the Libyans and the um, uh, the Medes. Uh, at that time, um, the predecessors of the Persians, um, continued for more than um, 25, 30 years. On and off, um, they um, gained um, land from uh, one another's um, country. But uh, around um, 600 uh, BC, the Libyan kingdom um, stretched from the Black Sea all the way to uh, the Aegean and the Mediterranean, almost half of um, Anatolia. And uh, before the big war, uh, the uh, king Croesus goes to Delphi, uh, to the oracle, famous oracle. And the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the prophecy uh, uh, encourages him to um, enter uh, the war with um, the Medes. Uh, the, um, the oracle says a great kingdom would be destroyed. Unfortunately, it turns out to be his kingdom that was to be destroyed by the end of the war. However, when you um, look at the, um, the archaeological evidence, you can uh, substantiate the um, uh, the the wealth and uh, and correlate to the fact that um, this was a very uh, serious wealthy strong uh, kingdom that um, accumulated um, uh, big wealth and they were capable of um, um, 
managing an invention uh, like coinage. Um, here is the, um, the tumulus of Aliates, about 355 meters in diameter and 63 meters high. Uh, it's one of the largest tumuli in the world. And um, unfortunately, it was um, uh, found and uh, plundered in antiquity. Um, so um, we don't know what was in, uh, but uh, just the size of it tells us that it was an important um, uh, king. Um, Gigas um, from early on adopted the image of the lion as his family's royal symbol. So this is um, one of the earliest coins that uh, we can call a coin. Together with uh, the earliest coins um, comes um, a strict um, weight system uh, with strict rules. Um, most of the time we call the, um, the largest denomination uh, about 14 and a half grams, uh, sometimes 15 and a half grams, we call them one stator. And then we have half staters, thirds, quarters, sixths, eighths, twelfths, one, 24th, 148th, 196th. An unbelievable um, denominational system that tells us that um, the um, uh, economic uh, system was um, developed enough to create all these different denominations. When we look at the, uh, the Lydian denominations, we only, the, the largest one is one third stator, uh, 4.73 grams, this coin. Um, they come uh, in various um, uh, slightly different uh, weights, 4.5550 uh, uh, is the, the lightest ones. Sometimes you see 5.1, 5.2 grams. Uh, but mostly around 4.50 grams. And then uh, you have um, smaller uh, half and half and one third, one fourth, one fifth, and one forty eighth, and finally one ninety sixth of a stator. This is unbelievable. Even though this um, smallest um, coin was. Uh, very valuable to um, purchase, say, a loaf of bread um, uh, or even a, 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 a chicken. Um, it was created to uh, be used in um, commerce. Uh, unlike uh, many um, uh, archaeologists believe, I um, claim that these coins were um, created to facilitate commerce, not, um, not uh, for um, uh, big payments like um, army um, um, campaigns and, and, and such. By the way, stator um, is um, a Greek word, um, means weighing, weight, the standard unit. And um, hectos, again, means one sixth of a unit. All these names that we use here are uh, modern inventions. Um, when you read um, ancient um, um, authors, they don't mention any names for any denominations. They simply say um, gold pieces, silver pieces. Um, you, uh, you read a lot of um, Cestertius uh, in Roman um, history, but um, and, and hardly denarii, denarii. These are all, um, even though denarii um, are known as um, um, a coin denomination, uh, earlier coins um, uh, unfortunately um, have no denominational names that we know of now. Some of the um, earliest Lydian electrum coins are inscribed with names in ancient Lydian um, script. And um, 
two prominent names, Walbet and Kukalim, um, were noticed. Um, however, it is not clear whether these are names of kings or just rich merchants who purchased, um, produced the, the earliest coins. And I uh, mostly uh, weigh on um, either um, rich merchants uh, or um, a, a monier, uh, a, a supervisor um, assigned by the king uh, to, uh, um, uh, to control the minting of um, coinage. Uh, the treasure tradition um, continues. If you look at the banknotes now, you usually uh, uh, see the signatures um, of um, central bank, bank um, directors, uh, uh, mostly around the world. Uh, not not uh, the names of um, um, presidents or, or others, even though we see the, um, the images of uh, monarchs um, on coins. Uh, they are not the ones that minted the coinage. This continued until the time of um, Alexander the Great. Anyways, um, this one is um, uh, supposedly um, uh, um, reads Kukalim, and um, and as you um, will remember, I gave you the names of the Libyan kings. There is no one. Uh, um, uh, nearly similar to Kukalim in the dynasty. And then um, you have Balbet uh, here. Again, um, no personage, historical uh, or mythological personage uh, is known by this name. However, it is very curious that from the earliest times that uh, we see coins uh, with inscriptions. So that tells us a little bit about the, um, uh, the, the literacy of the ancient uh, people. Uh, even though it's just one word, um, maybe just a name, yet it is uh, inscribed, of course, uh, for a reason. Um, a little while ago, in 2017, this coin appeared in the coin market. And um, as I mentioned uh, from uh, the earlier times, the numismatists and um, uh, ancient coin dealers um, wanted to attribute most of the early Libyan coins to Aliatis. And, and this one says a lampa Ypsilon, and, and almost another alpha here. So almost it says Aliatas. This looks a little, um, a little dubious, a little too obvious to me. Uh, however, um, I'm not in a position to, um, um, to go out and uh, say that this is fake. Um, but, um, it sold for um, um, a considerable amount of money. And um, so whoever purchased it um, will be part of the debate for the, um, for the years to come. Um, unless um, they begin to find um, other uh, examples, uh, especially in uh, other denominations. Um, in my view, um, this coin is, um, uh, is going to carry a big question mark on it. In any case, it's not impossible um, that um, Alvietas uh, struck coins with his name inscribed on them. Before uh, we see the coins of the Lydians, um, again, in the market, we come across um, a lot of ingots. Uh, in certain weight standards. Um, this one uh, is worth six staters, uh, so it's 92.41 grams. Uh, so based on the weight of this lump, we um, consider that one stater for the person who cast this was 14 and a half uh, grams. 
Um, and then here is um, another piece that was um, chopped into two, most likely, if not more. Uh, this is 71.11 grams. And finally, here is one, 10.72 grams. Um, uh, these are all um, ingots uh, found um, who knows where and by who. So when there is no um, archaeological context, it's hard to believe um, if they are real, because as you see, they're very easy. They, they don't have any um, art uh, or artistic um, features on them. And, um, and it's very easy to produce them, or it looks easy to produce them. I don't know. Uh, I always approach these uh, lumps with a certain reservation unless they come in um, different denominations and they show uh, similar characteristics uh, in their uh, production. Yet, these are not coins. Uh, these, we do not consider them um, uh, as coins. They are um, valuable, um, standardized, precious metals. Um, they might have been used in uh, trade. They must have, and they might have been um, an, an purchased um, in exchange for a certain amount of um, um, commodities. Uh, but they were not coins yet. And then we come across these um, items. I call them items because we still don't consider them um, to be um, coins. Um, yes, they are marked. Um, on uh, uh, the obverse, uh, we have some chisel marks. Um, we uh, call them um, saturated types. And on the reverse, we have punch marks, but they were intentional. Both the, uh, the obverse design and the reverse uh, design were intentional. So they are the beginning of coinage. And um, as I mentioned before, they come in different denominational weights. So 14 and a half grams, 17 point, uh, 17 and a half grams, 4.50 grams, mostly 2.25, 116, 124, um, and it goes uh, on and on all the way to 196 grams. Uh, they are uh, following a certain pattern of um, intentional um, strikes. Just to give you a perspective of uh, this, uh, one of the smallest denominations. This is not the smallest one. Uh, these are um, two coins uh, from my collection. Uh, this is a um, um, 0.96 gram um, uh, electrum. Um, coin. This is the obverse, um, no um, design. Uh, the reverse um, is, it's, it's, I think they um, simply cast it in um, a, a clay mold, and this is just the top of um, the, uh, uh, the, the cast. Uh, so it's, it's shapeless on, the, um, on one side and the other side is in the shape of the um, um, the mold, and this is a silver coin uh, from the fifth century. Um, it's again a very very uh, small coin. And how how did people um, make sure that they didn't lose these um, small um, precious metals at that time? Is 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 an amazing. Uh, thought that you know you can ponder on uh, for hours, if not days. And immediately, as soon as the Libyans um, start to, um, uh, or as soon as whoever created this denominational system, the weight system, you see different designs coming up from uh, every part of the um, in Aegean, the Western um, Anatolia. Not yet um, uh, the other, from the other side of the Egypt. 
only uh, from the um, eastern part of the agency. And from later uh, examples, we can safely attribute this um, rather um, obscure designed uh, coin to Miletus. Uh, this is the city um, of Miletus uh, uh, from the, um, the, uh, the sixth century, uh, 550s most likely. And this is an earlier um, um, coin from the same city using very similar um, punch um, marks. Uh, the earlier ones um, had no design in the punches, but uh, later on, the artistic um, um, ambitions of die engravers simply led them to um, uh, show their art, um, show their imagination on uh, the coin dies. And more denominations um, uh, are attributed to the city of um, Miletus. Uh, uh, and then, of course, the uh, designs um, on the overs, um, uh, reclining or crouching and um, uh, lying, turning his head and roaring. Um, obviously, um, it's an imitation um, of the Lydian um, um, idea. Uh, maybe just to give um, a legitimation to uh, the coins of Miletus, they uh, adopted um, uh, the image of uh, the lion. However, excavations um, uh, proved that there was um, a statue of um, a lion crouching or uh, crouching like this one and turning his head and roaring uh, found at Miletus. Uh, and on the reverse, uh, we see uh, punch marks with different designs uh, again. Then we have some very enigmatic and at the same time, very interesting series of coins that we would like to attribute to the city of Ephesus. Um, it's one of the earliest inscribed or the longest um, uh, inscribed uh, or a coin with the longest inscription, um, I would say, um, uh, comes along. Um, this one, for the first time, uh, is inscribed in uh, the Greek language. So we can uh, literally read uh, what's um, inscribed on it. It's retrograde. Um, so it is Phan, Phanos, Phanos, Ami, Sma. So um, apparently um, uh, it has two meanings. Uh, either I am the batch of Phanos, Phanos is a name, uh, or I am the sign of the bright one. So Bright One, of course, um, uh, is um, uh, Artemis. Um, uh, I'm sure you will, um, um, you will know um, the important cult of Artemis um, at Ephesus. Uh, so um, the uh, uh, scholars would like to um, connect this coin to um, Artemis. Uh, and that's why some scholars believe that uh, Faunus means uh, the bright one. And um, of course, um, stag being uh, one of the attributes of um, Artemis um, simply uh, leads us to believe that these coins were struck um, at Ephesus. And as you see, they come in various denominations. Uh, even down to 196th stater. There are many uncertain early Ionian um, coins uh, that come in many different uh, types. Uh, here is an enigmatic one. Uh, so this one was, um, uh, again, cast into um, a clay mold. 
So uh, this is the, uh, the lower part. This is the upper uh, part of the cast. And um, apparently um, there is a geometric whirl uh, pattern uh, struck on this part. And apparently this was uh, struck when the coin was uh, really hot. Uh, hence, uh, we see the cracks um, around here. Uh, later on, um, the uh, um, mint workers uh, discovered that um, striking hot um, uh, has many challenges, and, and, and one of the most important um, challenges uh, uh, was, of course, um, getting uh, lots of cracks on, on coins. Uh, the other one uh, they would uh, later discover uh, would um, uh, getting the uh, the dyes um, heated up very quickly, and and eventually um, uh, destroying. So they started to strike uh, cold. Um, and then we have from the earlier times we have the figural types. Um, when I first saw these figural types, I felt really um, uh, thrilled. And um, the artistic achievement of the earliest uh, coin die engravers, uh, engravers um, is, is um, amazing. Uh, you have um, a saturated background and uh, an archaic uh, face of a bearded man and a roaring uh, lion um, facing. Um, that figure. And uh, on, on the reverse, we have um, first um, a, a punch mark in the middle, and then uh, another punch mark uh, on top of that. So this was applied first, and then these two applied um, later. Um, and, and then uh, you have this one. Uh, obviously, this is a, a smaller uh, denomination. Uh, yet, um, I suspect, like many other numismatists, that they use the same one die to strike um, uh, coins in different denominations. This mm -hmm. one uh, uh, simply uh, is very similar to uh, the, uh, the figure here. Um, and and um, remember, these are really, really small coins. And of course, they come again in uh, other denominations. And I see this one. Uh, uh, I would like to think that this one is um, a, a female uh, figure. Um, um, so I don't know if um, uh, the intention was um, uh, placing the uh, the head of a female, a goddess maybe, uh, if not a queen, uh, on a coin. And, and if um, the, the standard is right, and if uh, the attribution is correct, uh, for Kaya, uh, modern uh, focha in Western um, Turkey, um, had the um, coin of the first female uh, depiction uh, on it. And then um, here is um, a male <coughs> head uh, with um, a, a kind of crown. Uh, the numismatists um, um, simply described it as a crested diadem, but it looks like an, an, a crown. And you know, modern, uh, uh, you know, our modern way of thinking of uh, a crown. It looks like uh, was it Midas? Who knows? And this uh, figural type just appeared uh, in the market in January this year. And um, it's, 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 again, a very enigmatic um, coin. Uh, you have a rider here galloping, and uh, you see um, a hound. It's not a dog, it, it's certainly a hound, but in uh, front of the, uh, the hound is another animal um, um, running. Um, is it a hare? Uh, we don't know. Then we have these um, different uh, design uh, types uh, that we call um, geometric types. Um, this one, simply the uh, 
the coin die engraver um, did his best uh, to make it different from uh, from any other known um, issue uh, by any other mint. And again, nobody knows from uh, which mint it comes. Uh, and this one, um, a geometric type raise swastika pattern. Then uh, on the reverse, uh, quadripartite ink. This one, um, a, a figural type, uh, a palmette uh, motif on the overs and on the reverse, we have a punch mark. And here uh, we have the uh, head of a lion facing to the right. More uncertain Ionian types. And um, if uh, someone tells you that abstract art was created in the um, um, 19th century, don't believe them. Uh, abstract art was known uh, um, century, century, uh, centuries ago. Um, facing lion head, um, a crab, a bridled horse, uh, a ram, and um, the siren uh, standing left, uh, a mythological figure from uh, the Odyssea. Many other cities were identified uh, minting coins. Um, Phocaea uh, is one of them. Uh, and this is uh, almost certain uh, Teos um, because uh, we have the same um, uh, head of griffin on the coinage of Teos strut later. Um, Samos, uh, mostly facing line um, figures. And this one is really interesting. Um, eagle flying uh, wings, eagle from, uh, seen from above, uh, holding a serpent in its talons. Ephesus, uh, from early on, adopted um, uh, the bee as the um, symbol of their city. Bee is uh, another attribute um, uh, of um, Artemis. Um, this one, um, people would like to um, identify as a bee, but I believe it's an ant. Um, however, um, we need to see other examples to uh, make sure what it, what exactly it is. And uh, Milasa from um, Caria, uh, from the um, uh, late um, sixth centuries, um, early fifth century, maybe five hundred eighties, and Kizikos. Um, uh, one of the most prominent uh, cities uh, on the um, um, on the coast of uh, Marmara Sea. Uh, later on, uh, Kizikos uh, would become a very important um, trade post and uh, issued many many uh, beautiful um, coins uh, uh, in electrum. Croesus, the um, king of uh, Lydia, um, as um, mentioned by Herodotus, issued the, um, the first gold and silver um, coins. And it was um, quite a revolutionary um, introduction. I don't say invention because the coinage um, had already been um, invented, but um, using um, a metal um, that is rare, limited um, its spread and use um, widely. Um, now the discussion is, um, was uh, the electrum used in um, uh, the first coins, uh, a natural alloy, or uh, 
was there a human intervention? Um, the excavations at Sardis uh, revealed that um, they, they simply had the technology to, um, to combine metals uh, in smelting. And, um, and there, there is enough evidence to believe that uh, electrum was even though available, found naturally um, to mint um, so many coins in so many different cities, uh, in so many denominations, uh, would not be possible to, um, to procure. How will you find um, so much electrum um, to export um, to um, mint coins in so many different um, cities? So it was probably something that the early coin uh, issuing people um, thought that they could limit to. Uh, to prevent uh, forgeries, uh, but um, by the time Croesus um, decided to change that idea, um, it was simply limiting the uh, the power of uh, this incredible invention. So gold and silver uh, were introduced as. Uh, coin metals for the first time by Croesus, and he created um, um, his own denominations from the beginning, both in gold and silver. So the heavy um, stator would be um, ten and a half grams. Uh, rarely you see eleven, um, um, eleven. 0.23 grams once, but mostly um, under 1070, 10.2, uh, 10.3. Yet it is admirable how they managed to um, uh, cast um, that kind of um, um, accurate weight uh, metals. 8.3, uh, 2.70, 134.67, 0.45. There are smaller ones too. And uh, the same is true for um, silver. Um, there are smaller ones. And um, the, the image changes um, with an addition of the uh, uh, four part of um, um, a bull uh, facing uh, a roaring line on both silver and gold coins. Again, several years ago, um, this coin appeared in the market. Uh, and um, it is again um, um, enigmatic, if not suspicious. And uh, the, um, the tradespeople uh, wanted to call it um, a pre um, gold, silver, uh, Croesus coins. Why they want to call it Croesus? Because uh, we see uh, the same um, animals, yet they are um, uh, facing uh, opposite directions, uh, which is not seen in art. Um, so this is, um, if, if, if it is an, a legitimate coin, uh, it was intended to be really different from um, any other uh, types. Or um, a modern forger's imagination, uh, and, and uh, he or she wanted to create something um, uh, unmatched. And, um, and you know, in, in both cases, and in ancient time and modern times, they achieved their goals. They um, created something uh unique there is no other example uh like these but of course again uh our question mark uh is going to um um hover um uh, on on this coin until um other examples uh in different denominations 
begin to appear in market or in excavations, hopefully. When the Libyans uh, were defeated by um, uh, the forces of Croesus, uh, the two, the second, um, the Achaemenid dynasty took over the, uh, the Libyan realm. Yet, um, they didn't have any coins at the beginning, so they continued using the coins of um, Croesus or the same types uh, for quite a long time until um, uh, during the um, time of um, Darius uh, the first, uh, Darius, um, between 522 and uh, 486, um, started uh, to use uh, his own empire's designs on coins, yet the um, the Libyan types continued to circulate alongside the, uh, the Persian uh, uh, design coins. And on the obverse of these coins, you have the uh, great king running, um, holding um, a ball and, um, and a spear. Uh, there are different uh, types. In this one, uh, the great king is depicted um, kneeling and uh, shooting a ball. Uh, in, in others, uh, sometimes the king is depicted um, uh, holding a dagger and a ball, and so many different types um, appear, but not as rich in terms of types as the uh, um, the, um, the Libyan and, um, and Ionian types that we see earlier. I have um, so coin uh, making techniques techniques uh, were um, not so difficult yet, uh, even though it, um, it, it looks um, uh, simple, it was, uh, it was quite, um, it was quite, it was a, a process that required a lot of expertise. I have a short video to show you here, and hopefully um, this will work. Oops, just a moment. I think I need to um, get out of the uh, presentation and I'll just start this. Um, this is not long, quite um, short. Bekajan, this is yes. Julian. Yeah, we can't hear anything or see the video. Oh, okay. Would it would, would uh, it be okay if we? No, this one this one doesn't have audio. Oh, okay. We're still not seeing anything. Oh, you don't see? No. Oh, I thought uh, people no, saw the video. We can't see it. Oh, I thought you didn't hear it. Just okay. Well, um, I guess um, the last time we did this, uh, the video worked fine. 
but for whatever reason, this one didn't. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, well, we, we, well, we're, we're, we're kind of running short on time anyway, so. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll just and... yeah yeah I'll just continue. But um, if you go to uh, anticoanoa.com, um, you can see this video. And uh, in the following presentation, uh, in the next presentation, we have a similar video that uh, shows um, an experimental um, strike of ancient coins. Uh, again, it was not a very difficult process, but um, it took a lot of expertise um, uh, to uh, strike coins. And here is um, a coin uh, from the Roman Republican time uh, that shows the uh, coin striking um, uh, apparatus. Uh, so it was a well-known uh, process by certain experts, but not um, people uh, walking um, out in the street. Okay, and uh, so by the time we, um, we came uh, to uh, the invention of coinage, um, seal engravers were um, ready to um, uh, work with the, uh, with the mints. Um, uh, engraving was well known uh, since the um, earlier Hittite and um, uh, Egyptian times. Um, Mesopotamian um, uh, seals are well known, Egyptian seals are well, well known. And um, um, a, a, a small number of um, dyes um, um, came to um, our time. Um, there's always this discussion that you know these were the forgers' dyes, but nobody um, really knows if they were really uh, the forgers' dyes or uh, legitimate dyes. Some of them are um, simply. Uh, associated to certain um, coins. So we know that um, they were um, quite realistic um, striking coins. Uh, but again, um, since we don't know the archaeological context, we're not in a position to attest to their um, uh, legitimacy, unfortunately. And, uh, Preparing the blanks um, uh, was uh, an issue from the big, uh, the, um, they first started using um, uh, dyes like this, and then uh, they went into, um, they went into uh, mass uh, production in this way. How do we know they use this? And here um, are two uh, photographs, um, the um, obverses and reverses uh, of uh, the same coin. And apparently uh, they used um, uh, the stick, uh, the complete uh, stick in this form format to strike coins. And it makes perfect sense. Uh, so um, one person was holding the stick um, of um, cast metal uh, blanks and the other person was uh, striking. And this was um, simply um, unseparated, uh, left as is. And here is a, a silver coin from um, Acragas uh, in Sicily, um, uh, separated uh, with a chisel. And you can see uh, the connection uh, here. And then, of course, um, they said, why don't we cast um, coins um, uh, directly? Uh, but apparently that process was not favored by um, all the mints, especially the, uh, uh, the um, quality was not so Im impressive. Um, early Romans um, favored that uh, system. Uh, later to abandon and um, go to the um, uh, original uh, striking uh, system. From the beginning, uh, we see um, counterfeits. Uh, counterfeits have always been uh, the nightmare of every legitimate uh, mint. Uh, I'm sure you will remember these uh, blank ones and then this um, uh, interesting uh, design, the palmet design. Uh, unfortunately, 
uh, you see the um, uh, precious metal plated uh, base metal um, forgeries coming from almost every mint. No mint was immune to um, forgery uh, at this time. Uh, just like uh, the coronavirus, no one is immune to it until um, a vaccine is created for it. Uh, to prevent um, forgeries uh, from uh, circulating, they came up with um, some um, ideas. Uh, they used banker's marks. This um, early Libyan coin has 14 banker's mark, uh, on it, marks on it. It's, it's a very, very remarkable example. So um, every merchant handled it, uh, put his own um, uh, mark um, on it. Uh, and, and it became um, um, something um, um, historic in, in its own right. And then, um, since they knew there were um, forgeries uh, circulating, they decided to um, test cut them. Um, the Athenians passed a law in 375 74, um, which provided for a dokimastes uh, or a tester to sit near the banking tables in the agora and test coins. Coins, um, whether um, they were coins um, uh, received by the tax um, collectors, government tax, uh, tax collectors, or merchants suspecting their um, coins. Uh, would go to um, these testers and get a, um, a, a test mark, uh, test cut uh, done. And if they uh, are found to be um, counterfeit, uh, they were slashed and withdrawn from circulation. There is quite a bit of material to uh, read and study the um, early um, coinage. Um, and here I give you a list of them. Um, there, um, some of them are um, available uh, online. Uh, others are available um, at the UBC library. I don't know if you have um, access to the library, uh, not at this time maybe, but um, later when uh, we normalize again after this pandemic. Uh, but almost all of them are available um, at the UBC uh, library. Um, I would recommend that you um, try to find uh, Karai's um, archaic and classical Greek coins. Um, it's from 1976, but it's, it's um, a very, very comprehensive um, uh, book about uh, the beginning of um, beginning and early um, ancient coinage. Uh, for modern um, uh, research, Korai uh, Konak and uh, Lorber's uh, White Gold, revealing the world's earliest coins uh, from uh, 2012, uh, is a good um, um, reference. Um, they have beautiful photographs of um, those early coins from the um, um, museum in Jerusalem. So you will find it uh, very um, uh, informative. Uh, Linz Alone's uh, Electrum and the Invention of Coinage is also uh, interesting. Uh, others um, are more scholarly work that you, know, you can um, uh, read and, and research if you like. Thank you very much.